Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and a happy new year. Here's another chapter of Volume 9, Part 1 of the Collected Works of C.G. Young. Enjoy. Chapter 4 The Psychology of the Child Archetype Part 1 Introduction The author of the companion essay on the mythology of the child or the child god has asked me for a psychological commentary on the subject of his investigations. Footnote This is Kerini, the primordial child in primordial times. I am glad to accede to his request, although the undertaking seems to me no small venture in view of the great significance of the child motif in mythology. Kerini himself has enlarged upon the occurrence of this motif in Greece and Rome, with parallels drawn from Indian, Finnish and other sources, thus indicating that the presentation of the theme would allow of yet further extensions. Though a comprehensive description would contribute nothing decisive in principle, it would nevertheless produce an overwhelming impression of the worldwide incidence and frequency of the motive. The customary treatment of mythological motifs so far, in separate departments of science, such as philology, ethnology, the history of civilization, and comparative religion, was not exactly a help to us in recognizing their universality, and the psychological problems raised by this universality could easily be shelved by hypotheses of migration. Consequently, Adolf Bastian's ideas met with little success in their day. Even then there was sufficient empirical material available to permit far-reaching psychological conclusions, but the necessary premises were lacking. Although the psychological knowledge of that time included myth formation in its province, witness Wundt's Völkerpsychologie, it was not in a position to demonstrate this same process as a living function actually present in the psyche of civilized man, any more than it could understand mythological motives as structural elements of the psyche. True to its history, when psychology was metaphysics first of all, then the study of the senses and their functions, and then of the conscious mind and its functions, psychology identified its proper subject with the conscious psyche and its contents, and thus completely overlooked the existence of a non-conscious psyche. Although various philosophers, among them Leibniz, Kant and Schelling, had already pointed very clearly to the problem of the dark side of the psyche, it was a physician who felt impelled, from his scientific and medical experience, to point to the unconscious as the essential basis of the psyche. This was C. G. Karras, the authority whom Eduard from Hartmann followed. In recent times it was, once again, medical psychology that approached the problem of the unconscious without philosophical preconceptions. It became clear from many separate investigations that the psychopathology of the neuroses and of many psychoses cannot dispense with the hypothesis of a dark side of the psyche, i.e. the unconscious. It is the same with the psychology of dreams, which is really the terra intermedia between normal and pathological psychology. In the dream, as in the products of psychoses, there are numberless interconnections to which one can find parallels only in mythological associations of ideas, or perhaps in certain poetic creations which are often characterized by a borrowing, not always conscious, from myths. Had thorough investigation shown that in the majority of such cases it was simply a matter of forgotten knowledge, the physician would not have gone to the trouble of making extensive researches into individual and collective parallels. But, in point of fact, typical mythologems were observed among individuals to whom all knowledge of this kind was absolutely out of the question, and where indirect derivation from religious ideas that might have been known to them, or from popular figures of speech, was impossible. Footnote. A working example can be found in The Concept of the Collective Unconscious. Such conclusions forced us to assume that we must be dealing with 
autochthonous revivals, independent of all the tradition, and, consequently, that myth-forming structural elements must be present in the unconscious psyche. Footnote. Freud, in his interpretation of dreams, paralleled certain aspects of infantile psychology with the Oedipus legend, and observed that its universal validity was to be explained in terms of the same infantile premise. The real working out of mythological material was then taken up by my pupils. I presented a somewhat more comprehensive examination of psychic and mythological parallels. See further also my essay in this volume, concerning the archetypes, with special reference to the anima concept. You can find a link to this in the description below. End of footnote. These products are never, or at least very seldom, myths with a definite form, but rather mythological components which, because of their typical nature, we can call motifs, primordial images, types, or as I have named them, archetypes. The child archetype is an excellent example. Today we can hazard the formula that the archetypes appear in myths and fairy tales just as they do in dreams and in the products of psychotic fantasy. The medium in which they are embedded in, in the formal case, an ordered and for the most part immediately understandable context, but in the latter case a generally unintelligible, irrational, not to say delirious sequence of images, which nonetheless does not lack a certain hidden coherence. In the individual, the archetypes appear as involuntary manifestations of unconscious processes, whose existence and meaning can only be inferred, whereas the myth deals with traditional forms of incalculable age. They hark back to a prehistoric world, whose spiritual preconceptions and general conditions we can still observe today among existing primitives. Myths on this level are as a rule tribal history handed down from generation to generation by word of mouth. Primitive mentality differs from the civilized chiefly in that the conscious mind is far less developed in scope and intensity. Functions such as thinking, willing, etc. are not yet differentiated. They are pre-conscious, and in the case of thinking, for instance, this shows itself in the circumstance that the primitive does not think consciously, but that thoughts appear. The primitive cannot assert that he thinks. It is rather that something thinks in him. The spontaneity of the act of thinking does not lie, casually, in his conscious mind, but in his unconscious. Moreover, he is incapable of any conscious effort of will. He must put himself beforehand into the mood of willing, or let himself be put there. Hence his rights d'entrée et de sortie, that French meaning entry and exit rights. His consciousness is menaced by an almighty unconscious. Hence his fear of magical influences which may cross his path at any moment. And for this reason, too, he is surrounded by unknown forces and must adjust himself to them as best he can. Owing to the chronic twilight state of his consciousness, it is often next to impossible to find out whether he merely dreamed something or whether he really experienced it. The spontaneous manifestation of the unconscious and its archetypes intrudes everywhere into his conscious mind, and the mythical world of his ancestors, for instance the Alkira or Bugari of the Australian aboriginals, is a reality equal if not superior to the material world. Footnote. This fact is well known, and the relevant ethnological literature is too extensive to be mentioned here. It is not the world as we know it that speaks out of his unconscious, but the unknown world of the psyche, of which we know that it mirrors our empirical world only in part, and that, for the other part, it moulds this empirical world in accordance with its own psychic assumptions. The archetype does not proceed from physical facts, 
but describes how the psyche experiences the physical fact. And in doing so, the psyche often behaves so autocratically that it denies tangible reality or makes statements that fly in the face of it. The primitive mentality does not invent myths, it experiences them. Myths are original revelations of the pre-conscious psyche, involuntary statements about unconscious psychic happenings and anything but allegories of physical processes. Footnote, see further, the structure of the psyche. Such allegories would be an idle amusement for an unscientific intellect. Myths, on the contrary, have a vital meaning. Not merely do they represent, they are the psychic life of the primitive tribe which immediately falls to pieces and decays when it loses its mythological heritage, like a man who has lost his soul. A tribe's mythology is its living religion, whose loss is always and everywhere, even among the civilized, a moral catastrophe. But religion is a vital link with psychic processes independent of and beyond consciousness, and a dark hinterland of the psyche. Many of these unconscious processes may be indirectly occasioned by consciousness, but never by conscious choice. Others appear to arise spontaneously, that is to say, from no discernible or demonstrable conscious cause. Modern psychology treats the products of unconscious fantasy activity as self-portraits of what is going on in the unconscious, or as statements of the unconscious psyche about itself. They fall into two categories. First, fantasies, including dreams, of a personal character, which go back unquestionably to personal experiences, things forgotten or repressed, and can thus be completely explained by individual anamnesis. Second, Fantasies, including dreams, of an impersonal character, which cannot be reduced to experiences in the individual's past, and thus cannot be explained as something individually acquired. These fantasy images undoubtedly have their closest analogues in mythological types. We must therefore assume that they correspond to certain collective and not personal structural elements of the human psyche in general, and, like the morphological elements of the human body, are inherited. Although tradition and transmission by migration certainly play a part, there are, as we have said, very many cases that cannot be accounted for in this way, and drive us to the hypothesis of autochthonous revival. These cases are so numerous that we are obliged to assume the existence of a collective psychic substratum. I have called this the collective unconscious. The products of this second category resemble the types of structures to be met with in myth and fairy tale, so much that we must regard them as related. It is therefore wholly within the realm of possibility that both the mythological types as well as the individual types arise under quite similar conditions. As already mentioned, the fantasy products of the second category, as also those of the first, arise in a state of reduced intensity of consciousness, that is, in dreams, delirium, reveries, visions, etc. In all these states, the check put upon unconscious contents by the concentration of the conscious mind ceases, so that the hitherto unconscious material streams as though from opened side sluices into the field of consciousness. This mode of origination is the general rule, except for certain cases of spontaneous vision and the processes in the method of active imagination, which I have described in the transcendent function, and the mysterium conjunctionis. Reduced intensity of consciousness and absence of concentration and attention, Janet's abaissement du niveau mental, correspond pretty exactly to the primitive state of consciousness in which, we must suppose, 
myths were originally formed. It is therefore exceedingly probable that the mythological archetypes, too, made their appearance in much the same manner as the manifestations of archetypal structures among individuals today. The methodological principle in accordance with which psychology treats the products of the unconscious is this. Contents of an archetypal character are manifestations of processes in the collective unconscious. Hence, they do not refer to anything that is or has been conscious, but to something essentially unconscious. In the last analysis, therefore, it is impossible to say what they refer to. Every interpretation necessarily remains an as-if. The ultimate core of meaning may be circumscribed, but not described. Even so, the bare circumscription denotes an essential step forward in our knowledge of the pre-conscious structure of the psyche, which was already in existence when there was as yet no unity of personality, even today the primitive is not securely possessed of it, and no consciousness at all. We can also observe this pre-conscious state in early childhood, and as a matter of fact it is the dreams of this early period that do not infrequently bring extremely remarkable archetypal contents to light. Footnote. The relevant material can be found in the unpublished reports of the seminars I gave at the Federal Polytechnic Institute in Zurich and in Michael Fordham's book The Life of Childhood. If, then, we proceed in accordance with the above principle, there is no longer any question whether a myth refers to the sun or the moon, the father or the mother, sexuality or fire or water. All it does is to circumscribe and give an approximate description of an unconscious core of meaning. The ultimate meaning of this nucleus was never conscious and never will be. It was, and still is, only interpreted, and every interpretation that comes anywhere near the hidden sense, or, from the point of view of scientific intellect, nonsense, which comes to the same thing, has always, right from the beginning, laid claim not only to absolute truth and validity, but to instant reverence and religious devotion. Archetypes were, and still are, living psychic forces that demand to be taken seriously, and they have a strange way of making sure of their effect. Always they were the bringers of protection and salvation, and their violation has, as its consequence, the perils of the soul, known to us from the psychology of primitives. Moreover, they are the unfailing causes of neurotic and even psychotic disorders, behaving exactly like neglected or maltreated physical organs or organic functional systems. An archetypal content expresses itself, first and foremost, in metaphors. If such a content should speak of the sun and identify with it the lion, the king, the hoard of gold guarded by the dragon, or the power that makes for the life and health of man, it is neither the one thing nor the other, but the unknown third thing that finds more or less adequate expression in all these similes, yet, to the perpetual vexation of the intellect, remains unknown and not to be fitted into a formula. For this reason, the scientific intellect is always inclined to put on airs of enlightenment in the hope of banishing the spectre once and for all. Whether its endeavors were called euhemerism or Christian apologetics or enlightenment in the narrow sense or positivism, there was always a myth hiding behind it, a new and disconcerting garb, which then, following the ancient and venerable pattern, gave itself out as ultimate truth. In reality, we can never legitimately cut loose from our archetypal foundations, unless we are prepared to pay the price of a neurosis, any more than we can rid ourselves of our body and its organs without committing suicide. If we cannot deny the archetypes, or otherwise neutralize them, we are confronted, 
At every new stage in the differentiation of consciousness to which civilization attains, with the task of finding a new interpretation appropriate to this stage, in order to connect the life of the past that still exists in us with the life of the present, which threatens to slip away from it. If this link-up does not take place, a kind of rootless consciousness comes into being no longer oriented to the past, a consciousness which succumbs helplessly to all manner of suggestions and, in practice, is susceptible to psychic epidemics. With the loss of the past now become insignificant, devalued, and incapable of revaluation, the savior is lost too, for the savior is either the insignificant thing itself or else arises out of it. Over and over again, in the metamorphosis of the gods, he rises up as the prophet or firstborn of a new generation and appears unexpectedly in the unlikeliest places, sprung from a stone, tree, furrow, water, etc., and in ambiguous form, top thumb, dwarf, child, animal, and so on. This archetype of the child god is extremely widespread and intimately bound up with all the other mythological aspects of the child motif. It is hardly necessary to allude to the still living Christ child, who, in the legend of Saint Christopher, also has the typical feature of being smaller than small and bigger than big. In folklore, the child motif appears in the guise of the dwarf or the elf as personification of the hidden forces of nature. To this sphere also belongs the little metal man of the late antiquity, who, till far into the Middle Ages, on the one hand inhabited the mine shafts and on the other represented the alchemical metals, above all Mercurius reborn in perfect form, as the hermaphrodite Filius Sapientiae, or Infant's Noster. Thanks to the religious interpretation of the child, a fair amount of evidence has come down to us from the Middle Ages, showing that the child was not merely a traditional figure, but a vision spontaneously experienced, as a so-called eruption of the unconscious. I would mention Meister Eckhart's vision to the naked boy and the dream of Brother Eustachius. Interesting accounts of these spontaneous experiences are also to be found in English ghost stories, where we read of the vision of a radiant boy, said to have been seen in a place where there are Roman remains. This apparition was supposed to be of evil omen. It almost looks as though we were dealing with the figure of a pur eternus, that is Latin for eternal boy, who had become inauspicious through metamorphosis, or, in other words, had shared the fate of the classical and the Germanic gods, who have all become bugbears. The mythical character of the experience is also confirmed in part two of Goethe's Faust, where Faust himself is transformed into a boy and admitted into the core of blessed youths, this being the larval stage of Dr. Marianus. In the strange tale called Das Reich ohne Raum by Bruno Goetz, a puer eternus named Fo, which equals to Buddha, appears with whole troops of unholy boys of evil significance. Contemporary parallels are better let alone. I mention this instance only to demonstrate the enduring vitality of the child archetype. The child motif not infrequently occurs in the field of psychopathology. The imaginary child is common among women with mental disorders and is usually interpreted in a Christian sense. Homunculi also appear as in the famous Schreber case, where they come in swarms and plague the sufferer. 
but the clearest and most significant manifestation of the child motif in the therapy of neuroses is in the maturation process of personality, induced by the analysis of the unconscious, which I have termed the process of individuation. Here we are confronted with pre-conscious processes, which, in the form of more or less well-formed fantasies, gradually pass over into the conscious mind, or become conscious as dreams, or, lastly, are made conscious through the method of active imagination. Footnote C. The relations between the ego and the unconscious. This material is rich in archetypal motifs, among them frequently that of the child. Often the child is formed after the Christian model. More often, though, it develops from earlier, altogether non-Christian levels, that is to say, out of chthonic animals such as crocodiles, dragons, serpents or monkeys. Sometimes the child appears in the cup of a flower, or out of a golden egg, or as the center of the mandala. In dreams it often appears as the dreamer's son, or daughter, or as a boy, youth or young girl. Occasionally it seems to be of exotic origin, Indian or Chinese, with a dusky skin, or, appearing more cosmically, surrounded by stars, or with a starry coronet, or as the king's son, or the witch's child, with demonic attributes. Seen as a special instance of the treasure hard to attain motif, the child motif is extremely variable and assumes all manner of shapes, such as the jewel, the pearl, the flower, the chalice, the golden egg, the quaternity, the golden ball, and so on. It can be interchanged with these and similar images almost without limit. Part 2. The Psychology of the Child Archetype 1. The Archetype as a Link with the Past As to the psychology of our theme, I must point out that every statement going beyond the purely phenomenal aspects of an archetype lays itself open to the criticism we have expressed above. Not for a moment dare we succumb to the illusion that an archetype can be finally explained and disposed of. Even the best attempts at explanation are only more or less successful translations into another metaphorical language. Indeed, language itself is only an image. The most we can do is to dream the myth onwards and give it a modern address. And whatever explanation or interpretation does to it, we do to our own souls as well, with corresponding results for our own well-being. The archetype, let us never forget this, is a psychic organ present in all of us. A bad explanation means a correspondingly bad attitude to this organ, which may thus be injured. But the ultimate sufferer is the bad interpreter himself. Hence, the explanation should always be such that the functional significance of the archetype remains unimpaired, so that an adequate and meaningful connection between the conscious mind and the archetypes is assured. For the archetype is an element of our psychic structure, and thus a vital and necessary component in our psychic economy. It represents or personifies certain instinctive data of the dark, primitive psyche, the real but invisible roots of consciousness. Of what elementary importance the connection with these roots is, we see from the preoccupation of the primitive mentality with certain magic factors, which are nothing less than what we would call archetypes. This original form of religio, that is linking back, is the essence, the working basis of all religious life even today, and always will be, whatever future form this life may take. There is no rational substitute for the archetype any more than there is for the cerebellum or the kidneys. We can examine the physical organs anatomically, histologically and embryologically, 
This would correspond to an outline of archetypal phenomenology and its presentation in terms of comparative history. But we only arrive at the meaning of a physical organ when we begin to ask teleological questions. Hence, the query arises, what is the biological purpose of the archetype? Just as physiology answers such a question for the body, so is it the business of psychology to answer it for the archetype. Statements like, the child motif is a vestigial memory of one's own childhood, and similar explanations merely beg the question. But if, giving this proposition a slight twist, we were to say, the child motif is a picture of certain forgotten things in our childhood, we are getting closer to the truth. Since, however, the archetype is always an image belonging to the whole human race and not merely to the individual, we might put it better this way. The child motif represents the pre-conscious, childhood aspects of the collective psyche. Footnote. It may not be superfluous to point out that lay prejudice is always inclined to identify the child motif with the concrete experience, child, as though the real child were the cause and precondition of the existence of the child motif. In a psychological reality, however, the empirical idea, child, is only the means, and not the only one, by which to express a psychic fact that cannot be formulated more exactly. Hence, by the same token, the mythological idea of the child is empathically not a copy of the empirical child, but a symbol, clearly recognizable as such. It is a wonder child, a divine child, begotten, born, and brought up in quite extraordinary circumstances, and not, this is the point, a human child. Its deeds are as miraculous or monstrous as its nature and physical constitution. Only on account of these highly unempirical properties is it necessary to speak of a child motive at all. Moreover, the mythological child has various forms. Now a god, giant, Tom Thumb, animal, etc., and this points to a causality that is anything but rational or concretely human. The same is true of the father and mother archetypes, which, mythologically speaking, are equally irrational symbols. We shall not go wrong if we take this statement, for the time being historically, on the analogy of certain psychological experiences which show that certain phases in an individual's life can become autonomous, can personify themselves to the extent that they result in a vision of oneself. For instance, one sees oneself as a child. Conditional on a dissociation having previously taken place between past and present. Such dissociations come about because of various incompatibilities. For instance, a man's present state may have come into conflict with his childhood state, or he may have violently sundered himself from his original character in the interests of some arbitrary persona more in keeping with his ambitions. He has thus become unchildlike and artificial and has lost his roots. All this presents a favorable opportunity for an equally vehement confrontation with the primary truth. In view of the fact that men have not yet ceased to make statements about the child god, we may perhaps extend the individual analogy to the life of mankind and say in conclusion that humanity too probably always comes into conflict with its childhood conditions, that is, with its original unconscious and instinctive state, and that the danger of the kind of conflict which induces the vision of the child actually exists. Religious observances, i.e. the retelling and ritual repetition of mythical events, consequently serve the purpose of being the image of childhood and everything connected with it, again and again before the eyes of the conscious mind so that the link with the original condition may not be broken. 2. The function of the archetype 
The child motif represents not only something that existed in the distant past, but also something that exists now. That is to say, it is not just a vestige, but a system functioning in the present, whose purpose is to compensate or correct, in a meaningful manner, the inevitable one-sidedness and extravagances of the conscious mind. It is in the nature of the conscious mind to concentrate on relatively few contents and to raise them to the highest pitch of clarity. A necessary result and precondition is the exclusion of other potential contents of consciousness. The exclusion is bound to bring about a certain one-sidedness of conscious contents. Since the differentiated consciousness of civilized man has been granted an effective instrument for the practical realization of its contents through the dynamics of his will, there is all the more danger, the more he trains his will of his getting lost in one-sidedness and deviating further and further from the laws and roots of his being. This means, on the one hand, the possibility of human freedom, but on the other, it is a source of endless transgressions against one's instincts. Accordingly, primitive man, being closer to his instincts, likes the animal, is characterized by fear of novelty and adherence to tradition. To our way of thinking, he is painfully backward, whereas we exalt progress. But our progressiveness though it may result in a great many delightful wish-fulfillments, piles up an equally gigantic Promethean debt which has to be paid off from time to time in the form of hideous catastrophes. For ages man has dreamed of flying, and all we have got for it is saturation bombing. We smile today at the Christian hope of a life beyond the grave, and yet we often fall into chiliasms a hundred times more ridiculous than the notion of a happy hereafter. Our differentiated consciousness is in continual danger of being uprooted, hence it needs compensation through the still existing state of childhood. The symptoms of compensation are described from the progressive point of view in scarcely flattering terms. Since, to the superficial eye, it looks like a retarding operation, people speak of inertia, backwardsness, skepticism, fault-finding, conservatism, timidity, pettiness, and so on. But inasmuch as man has, in high degree, the capacity for cutting himself off from his own roots, he may also be swept uncritically to catastrophe by his dangerous one-sidedness. The retarding ideal is always more primitive, more natural, in the good sense and in the bad, and more moral, in that it keeps faith with law and tradition. The progressive ideal is always more abstract, more unnatural, and less moral, in that it demands disloyalty to tradition. Progress enforced by will is always convulsive. Backwardness may be closer to naturalness, but in its turn it is always menaced by painful awakenings. The older view of things realized that progress is only possible dio concedente, meaning that only God gives it, thus proving itself conscious of the opposites and repeating the age-old rights d'entre et de sortier on a higher plane, which were a reminder the rights of entry and exit. The more differentiated consciousness becomes, the greater the danger of severance from the root condition. Complete severance comes when the dio concedente is forgotten. Now it is an axiom of psychology that when a part of the psyche is split off from consciousness, it is only apparently inactivated. In actual fact, it brings about a possession of the personality with the result that the individual's aims are falsified in the interests of the split-off part. If, then, the childhood state of the collective psyche is repressed to the point of total exclusion, the unconscious content overwhelms the conscious aim and inhibits, falsifies, and even destroys its realization. 
viable progress only comes from the cooperation of both. 3. The Futurity of the Archetype One of the essential features of the child motif is its futurity. The child is potential future. Hence, the occurrence of the child motif in the psychology of the individual signifies, as a rule, an anticipation of future developments, even though at first sight it may seem like a retrospective configuration. Life is in a flux, a flowing into the future, and not a stoppage or a backwash. It is therefore not surprising that so many of the mythological saviors are child gods. This agrees exactly with our experience of the psychology of the individual, which shows that the child paves the way for a future change of personality. In the individuation process, it anticipates the figure that comes from the synthesis of conscious and unconscious elements in the personality. It is, therefore, a symbol which unites the opposites, a mediator, bringer of healing, that is, one who makes whole. Because it has this meaning, the child motif is capable of the numerous transformations mentioned above. It can be expressed by roundness, the circle or sphere, or else by the quaternity as another form of wholeness. I have called this wholeness that transcends consciousness the self. The goal of the individuation process is the synthesis of the self. From another point of view, the term entelechy might be preferable to synthesis. There is an empirical reason why entelechy is, in certain conditions, more fitting. The symbols of wholeness frequently occur at the beginning of the individuation process. Indeed, they can often be observed in the first dreams of early infancy. This observation says much for the a priori existence of potential wholeness, and on this account, the idea of entelechy instantly recommends itself. But in so far as the individuation process occurs, empirically speaking, as a synthesis, it looks, paradoxically enough, as if something already existent were being put together. From this point of view, the term synthesis is also applicable. 4. Unity and plurality of the child motif In the manifold phenomenology of the child, we have to distinguish between the unity and plurality of its respective manifestations. Where, for instance, numerous homunculi, dwarfs, boys, etc. appear, having no individual characteristics at all, there is the probability of a dissociation. Such forms are therefore found especially in schizophrenia, which is essentially a fragmentation of personality. The many children, then, represent the products of its dissolution. But, if the plurality occurs in normal people, then it is the representation of an as yet incomplete synthesis of personality. The personality, viz. the self, is still in the plural stage, i.e., an ego may be present, but it cannot experience its wholeness within the framework of its own personality, only within the community of the family, tribe or nation. It is still in the stage of unconscious identification with the plurality of the group. The Church takes due account of this widespread condition in her doctrine of the corpus mysticum, of which the individual is by nature a member. If, however, the child motif appears in the form of a unity, we are dealing with an unconscious and provisionally complete synthesis of the personality, which, in practice, like everything unconscious, signifies no more than a possibility. 5. Child God and Child Hero Sometimes the child looks more like a child god, sometimes more like a young hero. Common to both types is the miraculous birth and the adversities of early childhood, abandonment and danger through persecution. The god is, by nature, wholly supernatural. The hero's nature is human, but raised to the limit of the supernatural. He is semi-divine. 
While the god, especially in his close affinity with the symbolic animal, personifies the collective unconscious, which is not yet integrated into a human being, the hero's supernaturalness includes human nature, and thus represents a synthesis of the divine, i.e. not yet humanized, unconscious, and human consciousness. Consequently, he signifies the potential anticipation of an individuation process, which is approaching wholeness. For this reason, the various child fates may be regarded as illustrating the kind of psychic events that occur in the entelechy or genesis of the self. The miraculous birth tries to depict the way in which the genesis is experienced. Since it is a psychic genesis, everything must happen non-empirically, e.g. by means of a virgin birth or by miraculous conception, or by birth from unnatural organs. The motives of insignificance, exposure, abandonment, danger, etc., try to show how precarious the psychic possibility of wholeness is. That is, the enormous difficulties to be met within attaining this highest good. They also signify the powerlessness and helplessness of the life urge, which subjects every growing thing to the law of maximum self-fulfillment while at the same time the environmental influences place all sorts of insuperable obstacles in the way of individuation. More especially the threat to one's innermost self from dragons and serpents points to the danger of the newly acquired consciousness being swallowed up again by the instinctive psyche, the unconscious. The lower vertebrates have from earliest times been favorite symbols of the collective psychic substratum, which is localized anatomically in the subcortical centers, the cerebellum and the spinal cord, as we sometimes call it, our lizard brain. These organs constitute the snake. Snake dreams usually occur, therefore, when the conscious mind is deviating from its instinctual basis. The motif of smaller than small yet bigger than big complements the impotence of the child by means of its equally miraculous deeds. This paradox is the essence of the hero and runs through his whole destiny like a red thread. He can cope with the greatest perils, yet, in the end, something quite insignificant is his undoing. Baldur perishes because of a mistletoe, Maui because of the laughter of a little bird, Siegfried because of his vulnerable spot, Heracles because of his wife's gift, others because of common treachery, and so on. The hero's main feat is to overcome the monster of darkness. It is the long-hoped-for and expected triumph of consciousness over the unconscious. Day and light are synonyms for consciousness, night and dark for the unconscious. The coming of consciousness was probably the most tremendous experience of primeval times, for with it a world became into being whose existence no one had suspected before. And God said, let there be light, is the projection of that immemorial experience of the separation of the conscious from the unconscious. Even among primitives today, the possession of a soul is a precarious thing, and the loss of soul is a typical psychic malady, which drives primitive medicine to all sorts of psychotherapeutic measures. Hence, the child distinguishes itself by deeds, which points to the conquest of the dark. Chapter 3. The Special Phenomenology of the Child Archetype 1. The Abandonment of the Child Abandonment, exposure, danger, etc., are all elaborations of the child's insignificant beginnings and of its mysterious and miraculous birth. This statement describes a certain psychic experience of a creative nature, whose object is the emergence of a new and as yet unknown content. In the psychology of the individual, there is always, at such moments, an agonizing situation of conflict, from which there seems to be no way out at least for the conscious mind, since as far as this is concerned, tertium non dator, which means no third possibility is given. 
But out of this collision of opposites, the unconscious psyche always creates a third thing of an irrational nature, which the conscious mind neither expects nor understands. It presents itself in a form that is neither a straight yes nor a straight no, and is consequently rejected by both. For the conscious mind knows nothing beyond the opposites and, as a result, has no knowledge of the thing that unites them. Since, however, the solution of the conflict through the union of opposites is of vital importance and is moreover the very thing that the conscious mind is longing for, some inkling of the creative act and of the significance of it nevertheless gets through. From this comes the numinous character of the child. A meaningful but unknown content always has a secret fascination for the conscious mind. The new configuration is a nascent whole. It is on the way to wholeness. At least in so far as it excels in wholeness, the conscious mind, when torn by opposites and surpasses it in completeness. For this reason, all uniting symbols have a redemptive significance. Out of this situation, the child emerges as a symbolic content, manifestly separated or even isolated from its background, that is the mother, but sometimes including the mother in its perilous situation, threatened on the one hand by the negative attitude of the conscious mind, and on the other by the horror vacui of the unconscious, which is quite ready to swallow up all its progeny since it produces them only in play and destruction is an inescapable part of its play. Nothing in all the world welcomes this new birth, although it is the most precious fruit of Mother Nature herself, the most pregnant with the future, signifying a higher stage of self-realization. That is why nature, the world of the instincts, takes the child under its wing. It is nourished or protected by animals. Child means something evolving towards independence. This it cannot do without detaching itself from its origins. Abandonment is therefore a necessary condition, not just a concomitant symptom. The conflict is not to be overcome by the conscious mind, remaining caught between the opposites. And for this very reason it needs a symbol to point out the necessity of detaching itself from its origins. Because the symbol of the child fascinates and grips the conscious mind, its redemptive effect passes over into consciousness and brings about that separation from the conflict situation which the conscious mind by itself was unable to achieve. The symbol anticipates a nascent state of consciousness. So long as this is not actually in being, the child remains a mythological projection which requires religious repetition and renewal by ritual. The Christ child, for instance, is a religious necessity only so long as the majority of men are incapable of giving psychological reality to the saying, except ye become as little children. Since all such developments and transitions are extraordinarily difficult and dangerous, it is no wonder that figures of this kind persist for hundreds or even thousands of years. Everything that man should and yet cannot be or do, be it in a positive or negative sense, lives on as a mythological figure and anticipation alongside his consciousness, either as a religious projection or, what is still more dangerous, as unconscious contents which then project themselves spontaneously into incongruous objects, e.g. hygienic and other salvationist doctrines or practices. All these are so many rationalized substitutes for mythology, and their unnaturalness does more harm than good. The conflict situation that offers no way out the sort of situation that produces the child as the irrational third is of course a formula appropriate only to a psychological, that is, modern stage of development. It is not strictly applicable to the psychic life of primitives, if only because primitive man's childlike range of consciousness still excludes a whole world of possible psychic experiences. 
Seen on the nature level of the primitive, our modern moral conflict is still an objective calamity that threatens life itself. Hence, not a few child figures are culture heroes and thus identified with things that promote culture, e.g. fire, metal, corn, maize, etc. As bringers of light, that is, enlargers of consciousness, they overcome darkness, which is to say that they overcome the earlier unconscious state. Higher consciousness, or knowledge going beyond our present-day consciousness, is equivalent to being all alone in the world. This loneliness expresses the conflict between the bearer or symbol of higher consciousness and his surroundings. The conquerors of darkness go far back into primeval times and, together with many other legends, prove that there once existed a state of original psychic distress, namely, unconsciousness. Hence, in all probability, the irrational fear which primitive man has of the dark even today. I found a form of religion among a tribe living on Mount Elgon that corresponded to pantheistic optimism. Their optimistic mood was, however, always in abeyance between six o'clock in the evening and six o'clock in the morning, during which time it was replaced by fear. For in the night, the dark being Aik has his dominion, the maker of fear. During the daytime, there were no monster snakes anywhere in the vicinity, but at night, they were lurking on every path. At night, the whole of mythology was let loose. 2. The Invincibility of the Child it is a striking paradox in all child myths that the child is on the one hand delivered helpless into the power of terrible enemies and in continual danger of extinction, while on the other he possesses powers far exceeding those of ordinary humanity. This is closely related to the psychological fact that though the child may be insignificant, unknown a mere child, he is also divine. From the conscious standpoint, we seem to be dealing with an insignificant content that has no releasing, let alone redeeming, character. The conscious mind is caught in its conflict situation and the combatant forces seem so overwhelming that the child, as an isolated content, bears no relation to the conscious factors. It is, therefore, easily overlooked and falls back into the unconscious. At least, that is what we should have to fear if things turned out according to our conscious expectations. Myth, however, emphasizes that it is not so, but that the child is endowed with superior powers and, despite all dangers, will unexpectedly pull through. The child is born out of the womb of the unconscious, begotten out of the depths of human nature, or, rather, out of living nature herself. It is a personification of vital forces quite outside the limited range of our conscious mind, of ways and possibilities of which our one-sided conscious mind knows nothing, a wholeness which embraces the very depths of nature. It represents the strongest, the most ineluctable urge in every being, namely, the urge to realize itself. It is, as it were, an incarnation of the inability to do otherwise, equipped with all the powers of nature and instinct, whereas the conscious mind is always getting caught up in its supposed ability to do otherwise. The urge and compulsion to self-realization is a law of nature, and thus of invincible power, even though its effect at the start is insignificant and improbable. Its power is revealed in the miraculous deeds of the child hero, and later in the athla, that is, works, of the bondsman or thrall of the Heracles type, where, although the hero has outgrown the impotence of the child, he is still in a menial position. The figure of the thrall generally leads up to the real epiphany of the semi-divine hero. Oddly enough, we have a similar modulation of themes in alchemy. 
in the synonyms for the lapis. As the materia prima, it is the lapis exilis et vilis. As a substance in process of transmutation, it is servus rubius or fugitivus, and, finally, in its true apotheosis, it attains the dignity of a filius sapientiae or deus terrenus, a light above all lights, a power that contains in itself all the powers of the upper and nether regions. It becomes a corpus glorificatum, which enjoys everlasting incorruptibility, and is therefore a panacea, a bringer of healing. The size and invincibility of the child are bound up in Hindu speculation with the nature of the Atman, which corresponds to the smaller than small yet bigger than big motive. As an individual phenomenon, the self is smaller than small. As the equivalent of the cosmos, it is bigger than big. The self, regarded as the counterpole of the world, its absolute other, is the sine qua non of all empirical knowledge and consciousness of subject and object. Only because of this psychic otherness is consciousness possible at all. Identity does not make consciousness possible. It is only separation, detachment and agonizing confrontation through opposition that produce consciousness and insight. Hindu introspection recognized this psychological fact very early and, consequently, equated the subject of cognition with the subject of ontology in general. In accordance with the predominantly introverted attitude of Indian thinking, the object lost the attribute of absolute reality and, in some systems, became a mere illusion. The Greek Occidental type of mind could not free itself from the conviction of the world's absolute existence, at the cost, however, of the cosmic significance of the self. Even today, Western man finds it hard to see the psychological necessity for a transcendental subject of cognition as the counterpole of the empirical universe, although the postulate of a world confronting self, at least as a point of reflection, is a logical necessity. Regardless of philosophy's perpetual attitude of dissent or only half-hearted assent, there is always a compensating tendency in our unconscious psyche to produce a symbol of the self in its cosmic significance. These efforts take on the archetypal forms of the hero myth, such as can be observed in almost any individuation process. The phenomenology of the child's birth always points back to an original psychological state of non-recognition, i.e. of darkness or twilight, of non-differentiation between subject and object, of unconscious identity of man and the universe. This face of non-differentiation produces the golden egg, which is both man and universe, and yet neither, but an irrational third. To the twilight consciousness of primitive man, it seems as if the egg came out of the womb of the wide world and were, accordingly, a cosmic, objective, external occurrence. To a differentiated consciousness, on the other hand, it seems evident that this egg is nothing but a symbol thrown up by the psyche, or, what is even worse, a fanciful speculation and therefore nothing but a primitive phantasm to which no reality of any kind attaches. Present-day medical psychology, however, thinks somewhat differently about these phantasms. It knows only too well what dire disturbances of the bodily functions and what devastating psychic consequences can flow from mere fantasies. These, quote, fantasies are the natural expressions of the life of the unconscious, but since the unconscious is the psyche of all the body's autonomous functional complexes, its fantasies have an etiological significance that is not to be despised. From the physiopathology of the individuation process, we know that the formation of symbols is frequently associated with physical disorders of a psychic origin, which in some cases are felt as decidedly real. In medicine, fantasies are real things 
with which the psychotherapist has to reckon very seriously indeed. He cannot therefore deprive of all justification those primitive phantasms whose content is so real that it is projected upon the external world. In the last analysis, the human body, too, is built of the stuff of the world, the very stuff wherein fantasies become visible, indeed, without it they could not be experienced at all. Without this stuff, they would be like a sort of abstract crystalline lattice in a solution where the crystallization process had not yet started. The symbols of the self arise in the depths of the body, and they express its materiality every bit as much as the structure of the perceiving consciousness. The symbol is thus a living body, corpus et anima, hence the child is such an apt formula for the symbol. The uniqueness of the psyche can never enter wholly into reality, it can only be realized approximately, though it still remains the absolute basis of all consciousness. The deeper layers of the psyche lose their individual uniqueness as they retreat farther and farther into darkness. Lower down, that is to say, as they approach the autonomous functional systems, they become increasingly collective until they are universalized and extinguished in the body's materiality, i.e. in chemical substances. The body's carbon is simply carbon. Hence, at bottom, the psyche is simply world. In this sense, I hold Kerenyi to be absolutely right when he says that in the symbol the world itself is speaking. The more archaic and deeper, that is, the more physiological the symbol is, the more collective and universal, the more material it is. The more abstract, differentiated, and specific it is, and the more its nature approximates to conscious uniqueness and individuality, the more it slaws off its universal character. Having finally attained full consciousness, it runs the risk of becoming a mere allegory, which nowhere oversteps the bounds of conscious comprehension, and is then exposed to all sorts of attempts at rationalistic, and therefore, inadequate explanation. 3. The Hermaphroditism of the Child It is a remarkable fact that perhaps the majority of cosmogonic gods are of a bisexual nature. The hermaphrodite means nothing less than a union of the strongest and most striking opposites. In the first place, this union refers back to a primitive state of mind, a twilight, where differences and contrasts were either barely separated or completely merged. With increasing clarity of consciousness, however, the opposites draw more and more distinctly and irreconcilably apart. If, therefore, the hermaphrodite were only a product of primitive non-differentiation, we would have to expect that it would soon be eliminated with the increasing civilization. This is by no means the case. On the contrary, man's imagination has been preoccupied with this idea over and over again on the high and even the highest levels of culture, as we can see from the late Greek and syncretic philosophy of Gnosticism. The hermaphroditic rabbis has an important part to play in the natural philosophy of the Middle Ages, and in our own day we hear of Christ's androgyny in Catholic mysticism. We can no longer be dealing, then, with the continued existence of a primitive phantasm, or with an original contamination of opposites. Rather, as we can see from medieval writings, the primordial idea has become a symbol of the creative union of opposites, a uniting symbol in the literal sense. In its functional significance, the symbol no longer points back, but forward to a goal not yet reached. Notwithstanding its monstrosity, the hermaphrodite has gradually turned into a subduer of conflicts and a bringer of healing. And it acquired this meaning in relatively early phases of civilization. This vital meaning explains why the image of the hermaphrodite did not fade out in primeval times, but, 
on the contrary, was able to assert itself with increasing profundity of symbolic content for thousands of years. The fact that such an idea so utterly archaic could rise to such exalted heights of meaning not only points to the vitality of archetypal ideas, it also demonstrates the rightness of the principle that the archetype, because of its power to unite opposites, mediates between the unconscious substratum and the conscious mind. It throws a bridge between present-day consciousness, always in danger of losing its roots, and a natural, unconscious, instinctive wholeness of primeval times. Through this meditation, the uniqueness, peculiarity, and one-sidedness of our present individual consciousness are linked up again with its natural, racial roots. Progress and development are ideals not likely to be rejected, but they lose all meaning if man only arrives at his new state as a fragment of himself, having left his essential hinterland behind him in the shadow of the unconscious, in a state of primitivity or, indeed, barbarism. The conscious mind, split off from its origins, incapable of realizing the meaning of the new state, then relapses all too easily into a situation far worse than the one from which the innovation was intended to free it. Exempla sunt odiosa, meaning the examples are odious. It was Friedrich Schiller who first had an inkling of this problem, but neither his contemporaries nor his successors were capable of drawing any conclusions. Instead, people incline more than ever to educate children and nothing more. I therefore suspect that the furor pedagogicus is a God-sent method of bypassing the central problem touched on by Schiller, namely the education of the educator. Children are educated by what the grown-up is, and not by what he says. The popular faith in words is a veritable disease of the mind for a superstition of this sort always leads farther and farther away from man's foundations and seduces people into a disastrous identification of the personality with whatever slogan may be in vogue. Meanwhile, everything that has been overcome and left behind by so-called progress sinks deeper and deeper into the unconscious, from which there re-emerges in the end the primitive condition of identity with the mass. Instead of the expected progress, this condition now becomes reality. As civilization develops, the bisexual primordial being turns into a symbol of the unity of personality, a symbol of the self, where the war of opposites finds peace. In this way, the primordial being becomes the distant goal of man's self-development, having been from the very beginning a projection of his unconscious wholeness. Wholeness consists in the union of the conscious and the unconscious personality. Just as every individual derives from masculine and feminine genes, and the sex is determined by the predominance of the corresponding genes, so in the psyche it is only the conscious mind in a man that has the masculine sign, while the unconscious is, by nature, feminine. The reverse is true in the case of a woman. All I have done in my anima theory is to rediscover and reformulate this fact. It had long been known. The idea of the conjunctio of male and female, which became almost a technical term in hermetic philosophy, appears in Gnosticism as the mysterium iniquitatis, that is, the mystery of evil, which was probably not uninfluenced by the Old Testament, in which the divine marriage appears as performed, for instance, by Hosea. Such things are hinted at not only by certain traditional customs, but by the quotation from the Gospel according to the Egyptians in the second epistle of Clement. When the two shall be one, the outside is the inside, and the male with the female, neither male nor female. Clement of Alexandria introduces this legion with the words, When ye have trampled on the garment of shame with thy feet, which probably refers to the body, for Clement, as well as Cassian, from whom the quotation was taken over, 
and the pseudo-clement, too, interpreted the words in a spiritual sense, in contrast to the Gnostics, who would seem to have taken the conjunctio all too literally. They took care, however, through the practice of abortion and other restrictions, that the biological meanings of their acts did not swamp the religious significance of the rite. While in church mysticism, the primordial image of the Hieros Gamos was sublimated on a lofty plane and only occasionally, as for instance with Mechthild of Magdeburg, approached the physical sphere in emotional intensity, for the rest of the world it remained very much alive and continued to be the object of a special psychic preoccupation. In this respect, the symbolical drawings of Opicinus de Canistris afford us an interesting glimpse of the way in which this primordial image was instrumental in uniting opposites, even in a pathological state. On the other hand, in the Hermetic philosophy that throve in the Middle Ages, the conjunctio was performed wholly in the physical realm. In the admittedly abstract theory of conjugium solis et lunae, which despite this drawback gave the creative imagination much occasion for anthropomorphic flights. Such being the state of affairs, it is readily understandable that the primordial image of the hermaphrodite should reappear in modern psychology in the guise of the male-female antithesis, in other words, as male consciousness and personified female unconscious. But the psychological process of bringing things to consciousness has complicated the picture considerably. Whereas the old science was almost exclusively a field in which only the man's unconscious could project itself, the new psychology had to acknowledge the existence of an autonomous female psyche as well. Here the case is reversed, and a feminine consciousness confronts a masculine personification of the unconscious which can no longer be called anima, but animus. This discovery also complicates the problem of the conjunctio. Originally, this archetype played its part entirely in the field of fertility magic, and thus remained for a very long time a purely biological phenomenon, with no other purpose than that of fecundation. But even in the early antiquity, the symbolical meaning of the act seems to have increased. Thus, for example, the physical performance of the Hieros Gamos as a sacred rite not only became a mystery, it faded to a mere conjecture. Footnote. According to Hippolytus's account, the Hierophant actually made himself impotent by a draught of hemlock. The self-castration of priests in the worship of the mother goddess is of similar import. As we have seen, Gnosticism too endeavoured in all seriousness to subordinate the physiological to the metaphysical. Finally, the Church severed the conjunctio from the physical realm altogether, and natural philosophy turned it into an abstract theoria. These developments meant the gradual transformation of the archetype into a psychological process, which, in theory, we can call a combination of conscious and unconscious processes. In practice, however, it is not so simple, because as a rule the feminine unconscious of a man is projected upon a feminine partner, and the masculine unconscious of a woman is projected upon a man. The elucidation of these problems is a special branch of psychology, and has no part in the discussion of the mythological hermaphrodite. 4. The child is beginning and end. Faust, after his death, is received as a boy into the core of blessed youths. I do not know whether Goethe was referring with this peculiar idea to the cupids on antique gravestones. It is not unthinkable. The figure of the cuculatus points to the hooded, that is, the invisible one, the genius of the departed who reappears in the childlike frolics of a new life, surrounded by the sea forms of dolphins and tritons. The sea is the favorite symbol of the unconscious, the mother of all that lives. Just as the child is, in certain circumstances, e.g. in the case of Hermes and the dactyls, closely related to the phallus, symbol of the begetter, so it comes up again in the sepulchral phallus, 
symbol of a renewed begetting. The child is therefore Renatus in novum infantium. That means reborn into a new infancy. It is thus both beginning and end, an initial and a terminal creature. The initial creature existed before man was, and the terminal creature will be when man is not. Psychologically speaking, this means that the child symbolizes the pre-conscious and the post-conscious essence of man. His pre-conscious essence is the unconscious state of earliest childhood. His post-conscious essence is an anticipation by analogy of life after death. In this idea, the all-embracing nature of psychic wholeness is expressed. Wholeness is never comprised within the compass of the conscious mind. It includes the indefinite and indefinable extent of the unconscious as well. Wholeness, empirically speaking, is therefore of immeasurable extent, older and younger than consciousness, and enfolding it in time and space. This is no speculation, but an immediate psychic experience. Not only is the conscious process continually accompanied, it is often guided, helped, or interrupted by unconscious happenings. The child had a psychic life before it had consciousness. Even the adult still says and does things whose significance he realizes only later, if ever. And yet, he said them, and did them, as if he knew what they meant. Our dreams are continually saying things beyond our conscious comprehension, which is why they are so useful in the therapy of neuroses. We have intimations and intuitions from unknown sources, Fears, moods, plans, and hopes come to us with no visible causation. These concrete examples are at the bottom of our feeling that we know ourselves very little, at the bottom, too, of the painful conjecture that we might have surprises in store for ourselves. Primitive man is no puzzle to himself. The question, what is man? is the question that man has always kept until last. Primitive man has so much psyche outside his conscious mind that the experience of something psychic outside him is far more familiar to him than to us. Consciousness hedged about by psychic powers, sustained or threatened or deluded by them, is the age-old experience of mankind. This experience has projected itself into the archetype of the child, which expresses man's wholeness. The child is all that is abandoned and exposed and at the same time divinely powerful, the insignificant dubious beginning and the triumphal end. The eternal child in man is an indescribable experience, an incongruity, a handicap and a divine prerogative an imponderable that determines the ultimate worth or worthlessness of a personality. Chapter 4. Conclusion I am aware that a psychological commentary on the child archetype without detailed documentation must remain a mere sketch. But since this is virgin territory for the psychologist, my main endeavor has been to stake out the possible extent of the problems raised by our archetype and to describe, at least cursorily, its different aspects. Clear-cut distinctions and strict formulations are quite impossible in this field, seeing that a kind of fluid interpenetration belongs to the very nature of all archetypes. They can only be roughly circumscribed at best. Their living meaning comes out more from their presentation as a whole than from a single formulation. Every attempt to focus them more sharply is immediately punished by the intangible core of meaning losing its luminosity. No archetype can be reduced to a simple formula. It is a vessel which can never be empty and never fill. It has a potential existence only, and when it takes shape and matter, it is no longer what it was. It persists throughout the ages and requires interpreting ever anew. 
The archetypes are the imperishable elements of the unconscious, but they change their shape continually. It is a well-nigh hopeless undertaking to tear a single archetype out of the living tissue of the psyche, but, despite their interwovenness, they do form units of meaning that can be apprehended intuitively. Psychology, as one of the many expressions of psychic life, operates with ideas which, in their turn, are derived from archetypal structures and thus generate a somewhat more abstract kind of myth. Psychology, therefore, translates the archaic speech of myth into a modern mythologem, not yet of course recognized as such, which constitutes one element of the myth science. This seemingly hopeless undertaking is a living and lived myth, satisfying to persons of a corresponding temperament, indeed beneficial in so far as they have been cut off from their psychic origins by neurotic dissociation. As a matter of experience, we meet the child archetype in spontaneous and in therapeutically induced individuation processes. The first manifestation of the child is as a rule a totally unconscious phenomenon. Here the patient identifies himself with his personal infantilism. Then, under the influence of therapy, we get a more or less gradual separation from and objectification of the child, that is, the identity breaks down and is accompanied by an intensification, sometimes technically induced, of fantasy, with the results that archaic or mythological features become increasingly apparent. Further transformations run true to the hero myth. The theme of mighty feats is generally absent, but on the other hand, the mythical dangers play all the greater part. At this stage, there is usually another identification, this time with the hero, whose role is attractive for a variety of reasons. The identification is often extremely stubborn and dangerous to the psychic equilibrium. If it can be broken down and if consciousness can be reduced to human proportions, the figure of the hero can gradually be differentiated into a symbol of the self. In practical reality, however, it is of course not enough for the patient merely to know about such developments. What counts is his experience of the various transformations. The initial stage of personal infantilism presents the picture of an abandoned or misunderstood and unjustly treated child with overweening pretensions. The epiphany of the hero, the second identification, shows itself in a corresponding inflation. The colossal pretension grows into a conviction that one is something extraordinary, or else the impossibility of the pretension ever being fulfilled only proves one's own inferiority, which is favorable to the role of the heroic sufferer, a negative inflation. In spite of their contradictoriness, both forms are identical, because conscious megalomania is balanced by unconscious compensatory inferiority and conscious inferiority by unconscious megalomania. You never get one without the other. Once the reef of the second identification has been successfully circumnavigated, conscious processes can be cleanly separated from the unconscious, and the latter observed objectively. This leads to the possibility of an accommodation with the unconscious, and thus to a possible synthesis of the conscious and unconscious elements of knowledge and action. This, in turn, leads to a shifting of the center of personality from the ego to the self. A more detailed account of these developments is to be found in The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. In this psychological framework, the motives of abandonment, invincibility, hermaphroditism, and beginning and end take their place as distinct categories of experience and understanding. The Psychological Aspects of the Cori Not only is the figure of Demeter and Cori in its threefold aspect as maiden, mother and Hecate not unknown to the psychology, not unknown to the psychology of the unconscious, it is even something of a practical problem. The Cori 
has her psychological counterpart in those archetypes which I have called the self or subordinate personality on the one hand and the anima on the other. In order to explain these figures, with which I cannot assume all the listeners to be familiar, I must begin with some remarks of a general nature. The psychologist has to contend with the same difficulties as the mythologist when an exact definition or clear and concise information is demanded of him. The picture is concrete, clear, and subject to no misunderstanding only when it is seen in its habitual context. In this form, it tells us everything it contains. But as soon as one tries to abstract the real essence of the picture, the whole thing becomes cloudy and indistinct. In order to understand its living function, we must let it remain an organic thing in all its complexity and not try to examine the anatomy of its corpse in the manner of the scientist or the archaeology of its ruin in the manner of the historian. Naturally, this is not to deny the justification of such methods when applied in their proper place. In view of the enormous complexity of psychic phenomena, a purely phenomenological point of view is, and will be for a long time, the only possible one, and the only one with any prospect of success. Whence things come, and what they are, these, particularly in the field of psychology, are questions which are apt to call forth untimely attempts at explanation. Such speculations are moreover based far more on unconscious philosophical premises than on the nature of the phenomena themselves. Psychic phenomena, occasioned by unconscious processes, are so rich and so multifarious that I prefer to describe my findings and observations and, were possible to classify them, that is, to arrange them under certain definite types. That is the method of natural science, and it is applied wherever we have to do with multifarious and still unorganized material. One may question the utility or the appropriateness of the categories or types used in the arrangement, but not the correctness of the method itself. Since for years I have been observing and investigating the products of the unconscious in the widest sense of the word, namely dreams, fantasies, visions and delusions of the insane, I have not been able to avoid recognizing certain regularities, that is, types. There are types of situations and types of figures that repeat themselves frequently and have a corresponding meaning. I therefore employ the term motif to designate these repetitions. Thus, there are not only typical dreams, but typical motifs in the dreams. These may, as we have said, be situations or figures. Among the latter, there are human figures that can be arranged under a series of archetypes, the chief of them being, according to my suggestion, the shadow, the wise old man, the child, including the child hero, the mother, primordial mother and earth mother, as a subordinate personality, daemonic being subordinate, and her counterpart, the maiden, and lastly, the anima in man and the animus in woman. The above types are far from exhausting all the statistical regularities in this respect. The figure of the quarry that interests us here belongs, when observed in a man, to the anima type, and when observed in a woman, to the type of subordinate personality. It is an essential characteristic of psychic figures that they are duplex, or at least capable of duplication. At all events they are bipolar and oscillate between their positive and negative meanings. Thus, the superordinate personality can appear in a despicable and distorted form, like, for instance, Mephistopheles, who is really more positive as a personality than the vapid and unthinking careerist Faust. Another negative figure is the Tom Thumb or Tom Dumb of the folk tales. The figure corresponding to the Cory in a woman is generally a double one, i.e., a mother and a maiden which is to say that she appears now as the one, now as the other. From this I would conclude for a start, that in the formation of the Demeter-Cori myth, 
the feminine influence so far outweighed the masculine that the latter had practically no significance. The man's role in the Demeter myth is really only that of seducer or conqueror. As a matter of practical observation, the Cori often appears in woman as an unknown young girl, not infrequently as Gretchen or the unmarried mother. Another frequent modulation is the dancer, who is often formed by borrowings from classical knowledge, in which case the maiden appears as the Coriband, Maenad, or Nymph. An occasional variant is the Nixie, or water sprite, who betrays her superhuman nature by her fishtail. Sometimes the Cori and mother figures slither down altogether to the animal kingdom, the favorite representatives then being a cat, or the snake, or the bear, or else some black monster of the underworld like the crocodile or other salamander-like saurian creatures. The maiden's helplessness exposes her to all sorts of dangers, for instance of being devoured by reptiles or ritually slaughtered like a beast of sacrifice. Often there are bloody, cruel, and even obscene orgies to which the innocent child falls victim. Sometimes it is a true nekia, a descent into Hades, and a quest for the treasure hard to attain, occasionally connected with orgiastic sexual rites or offerings of menstrual blood to the moon. Oddly enough, the various tortures and obscenities are carried out by an earth mother. There are drinkings of blood and bathings in blood, also crucial fixations. Footnote. One of my patients whose principal difficulty was a negative mother complex developed a series of fantasies on a primitive mother figure, an Indian woman, who instructed her on the nature of woman in general. In these pronouncements, a special paragraph is devoted to blood, running as follows. A woman's life is close to the blood. Every month she is reminded of this, and birth is indeed a bloody business, destructive and creative. A woman is only permitted to give birth, but the new life is not her creation. In her heart of hearts, she knows this and rejoices in the grace that has fallen to her. She is a little mother, not the great mother, but her little pattern is like the great pattern. If she understands this, she is blessed by nature, because she has submitted in the right way and can thus partake of the nourishment of the great mother. End of footnote. The maiden who crops up in case histories differs not inconsiderably from the vague flower-like Cori, in that the modern figure is more sharply delineated and not nearly so unconscious as the following examples will show. The figures corresponding to Demeter and Hecate are subordinate, not to say over life-size mothers, ranging from the Pieta type to the Baobo type. The unconscious, which acts as a counterbalance to woman's conventional innocuousness, proves to be highly inventive in this latter respect. I can recall only a very few cases where Demeter's own noble figure in its pure form breaks through as an image rising spontaneously from the unconscious. I remember a case, in fact, where a maiden goddess appears clad all in purest white, but carrying a black monkey in her arms. The Earth Mother is always chthonic and is occasionally related to the moon, either through the blood sacrifice already mentioned, or through a child sacrifice, or else because she is adorned with a sickle moon. In pictorial or plastic representations, the mother is dark deepening to black or red, these being her principal colors, and with a primitive or animal expression of face. In form, she not infrequently resembles the Neolithic ideal of the Venus of Bresempoi, or that of Willendorf, or again the sleeper of Hal Safliani. Now and then I have come across multiple breasts, arranged like those of a sow. The Earth Mother plays an important part in the woman's unconscious for all her manifestations are described as powerful. 
This shows that in such cases, the Earth Mother element in the conscious mind is abnormally weak and requires strengthening. In view of all this, it is, I admit, hardly understandable why such figures should be reckoned as belonging to the type of superordinate personality. In a scientific investigation, however, one has to disregard moral or aesthetic prejudices and let the facts speak for themselves. The maiden is often described as not altogether human in the usual sense. She is either of unknown or peculiar origin, or she looks strange or undergoes strange experiences, from which one is forced to infer the maiden's extraordinary, myth-like nature. Equally, and still more strikingly, the Earth Mother is a divine being, in the classical sense. Moreover, she does not by any means always appear in the guise of Bobo, but for instance, more like Queen Venus in the Hypnerotomachia Polyphili, though she is invariably heavy with destiny. The often unesthetic forms of the Earth Mother are in keeping with a prejudice of the modern feminine unconscious. This prejudice was lacking in antiquity. The underworld nature of Hecate, who is closely connected with Demeter, and Persephone's fate both point nevertheless to the dark side of the human psyche, though not to the same extent as the modern material. The, quote, superordinate personality is the total man, i.e. man as he really is, not as he appears to himself. To this wholeness the unconscious psyche also belongs, which has its requirements and needs just as consciousness has. I do not want to interpret the unconscious personalistically and assert, for instance, that fantasy images like those described above are the wish fulfillments due to repression. These images were as such never conscious and consequently could never have been repressed. I understand the unconscious rather as an impersonal psyche common to all men, even though it expresses itself through a personal consciousness. When anyone breathes, his breathing is not a phenomenon to be interpreted personally. The mythological images belong to the structure of the unconscious and are an impersonal possession. In fact, the great majority of men are far more possessed by them than possessing them. Images like those described above give rise under certain conditions to corresponding disturbances and symptoms, and it is then the task of medical therapy to find out whether and how and to what extent these impulses can be integrated with the conscious personality or whether they are a secondary phenomenon which some defective orientation of consciousness has brought out its normal potential state into actuality. Both possibilities exist in practice. I usually describe the superordinate personality as the self, thus making a sharp distinction between the ego, which, as is well known, extends only as far as the conscious mind, and the whole of the personality which includes the unconscious as well as the conscious component. The ego is thus related to the self as part to whole. To that extent, the self is superordinate. Moreover, the self is felt empirically not as subject, but as object, and this by reason of its unconscious component, which can only come to consciousness indirectly, by way of projection, because of its unconscious component, the self is so far removed from the conscious mind that it can only be partially expressed by human figures. The other part of it has to be expressed by objective, abstract symbols. The human figures are father and son, mother and daughter, king and queen, god and goddess. Theriomorphic symbols are the dragon, snake, elephant, lion, bear, and other powerful animals, or again, the spider, crab, butterfly, beetle, worm, etc. Plant symbols are generally flowers, e.g. lotus and rose. These lead on to geometrical figures like the circle, the sphere, the square, the quaternity, the clock, 
the firmament, and so on. The indefinite extent of the unconscious component makes a comprehensive description of the human personality impossible. Accordingly, the unconscious supplements the picture with living figures ranging from the animal to the divine, as the two extremes outside man, and rounds out the animal extreme through the addition of vegetable and inorganic abstractions into a microcosm. These addenda have a high frequency in anthropomorphic divinities, where they appear as attributes. Demeter and Cori, mother and daughter, extend the feminine consciousness both upwards and downwards. They add an older and younger, stronger and weaker dimension to it, and widen out the narrowly limited conscious mind bound in space and time, giving it intimations of a greater and more comprehensive personality, which has a share in the eternal course of things. We can hardly suppose that myth and mystery were invented for any conscious purpose. It seems much more likely that they were the involuntary revelation of a psychic, but unconscious, precondition. The psyche pre-existent to consciousness, e.g. in the child, participates in the maternal psyche on the one hand, while on the other it reaches across to the daughter psyche. We could therefore say that every mother contains her daughter in herself, and every daughter her mother, and that every woman extends backwards into her mother and forwards into her daughter. This participation and intermingling give rise to that peculiar uncertainty as regards time. A woman lives earlier as a mother, later as a daughter. The conscious experience of these ties produces the feeling that her life is spread out over generations. The first step towards the immediate experience and conviction of being outside time, which brings with it a feeling of immortality. The individual's life is elevated into a type, indeed it becomes the archetype of woman's fate in general. This leads to a restoration or apocatastasis of the lives of her ancestors who now, through the bridge of the momentary individual, pass down into the generations of the future. An experience of this kind gives the individual a place and a meaning in the life of the generations, so that all unnecessary obstacles are cleared out of the way of the life stream that is to flow through her. At the same time, the individual is rescued from her isolation and restored to wholeness. All ritual preoccupation with archetypes ultimately has this aim and this result. It is immediately clear to the psychologist what cathartic and at the same rejuvenating effects must flow from the Demeter cult into the feminine psyche, and what a lack of psychic hygiene characterizes our culture, which no longer knows the kind of wholesome experience afforded by Eleusinian emotions. I take full account of the fact that not only the psychologically minded layman, but the professional psychologist and psychiatrist as well, and even the psychotherapist, do not possess an adequate knowledge of their patient's archetypal material, insofar as they have not specially investigated this aspect of the phenomenology of the unconscious. For it is precisely in the field of psychiatric and psychotherapeutic observation that we frequently meet with cases characterized by a rich crop of archetypal symbols. Since the necessary historical knowledge is lacking to the physician observing them, he is not in a position to perceive the parallelism between his observations and the findings of anthropology and the humane sciences in a general. Conversely, an expert in mythology and comparative religion is, as a rule, no psychiatrist, and, consequently, does not know that his mythologems are still fresh and living, for instance, in dreams and visions, in the hidden recesses of our most personal life, which we could on no account deliver up to scientific dissection. The archetypal material is therefore the great unknown, 
and it requires special study and preparation even to collect such material. It does not seem to me superfluous to give a number of examples from my case histories which bring out the occurrence of archetypal images in dreams or fantasies. Time and again with my public I come across the difficulty that they imagine illustration by a few examples to be the simplest thing in the world. In actual fact, it is almost impossible with a few words and one or two images torn out of their context to demonstrate anything. This only works when dealing with an expert. What Perseus has to do with the Gorgon's head would never occur to anyone who did not know the myth. So it is with the individual images. They need a context, and the context is not only a myth, but an individual anamnesis. Such contexts, however, are of enormous extent. Anything like a complete series of images would require for its proper presentation a book of about 200 pages. My own investigation of the Miller fantasies gives some idea of this. Footnote. See further Symbols of Transformation. In H. G. Bain's book, the mythology of the soul runs to 939 pages and endeavors to do justice to the material provided by only two cases. End of footnote. It is therefore with the greatest hesitation that I make the attempt to illustrate from case histories. The material I shall use comes partly from normal, partly from slightly neurotic persons. It is part dream, part vision, or dream mixed with visions. These, quote, visions are far from being hallucinations or ecstatic states. They are spontaneous visual images of fantasy or so-called active imagination. The latter is a method, devised by myself, of introspection for observing the stream of interior images. One concentrates one's attention on some impressive but unintelligible dream image, or on a spontaneous visual impression, and observes the changes taking place in it. Meanwhile, of course, all criticism must be suspended and the happenings observed and noted with absolute objectivity. Obviously, too, the observation that the whole thing is arbitrary or thought up must be set aside since it springs from the anxiety of an ego consciousness which brooks no master besides itself in its own house. In other words, it is the inhibition exerted by the conscious mind on the unconscious. Under these conditions, long and often very dramatic series of fantasies ensue. The advantage of this method is that it brings a mass of unconscious material to light. Drawing, painting, and modeling can be used to the same end. Once a visual series has become dramatic, it can easily pass over into the auditive or linguistic sphere and give rise to dialogues and the like. With slightly pathological individuals, and particularly in the not infrequent cases of latent schizophrenia, the method may, in certain circumstances, proved to be rather dangerous and therefore requires medical control. It is based on a deliberate weakening of the conscious mind and its inhibiting effect, which either limits or suppresses the unconscious. The aim of the method is naturally therapeutic in the first place, while in the second it also furnishes rich empirical material. Some of our examples are taken from this. They differ from dreams only by reason of their better form, which comes from the fact that the contents were perceived not by a dreaming, but by a waking consciousness. The examples are from women in middle life. 1. Case X. Spontaneous visual impressions in chronological order. 1. I saw a white bird with outstretched wings. It alighted on the figure of a woman, clad in blue, who sat there like an antique statue. 
The bird perched on her hand, and in it she held a grain of wheat. The bird took it in its beak and flew into the sky again. For this, X painted a picture. A blue-clad, archaically simple mother figure on a white marble base. Her maternity is emphasized by the large breasts. 2. A bull lifts a child up from the ground and carries it to the antique statue of a woman. A naked young girl with a wreath of flowers in her hair appears, riding on a white bull. She takes the child and throws it into the air like a ball and catches it again. The white bull carries them both to a temple. The girl lays the child on the ground, and so on. Initiation follows. In this picture, the maiden appears rather in the form of Europa. Here a certain school knowledge is being made use of. Her nakedness and the wreath of flowers point to Dionysian abandonment. The game of ball with the child is the motive of some secret rite which always has to do with child sacrifice. See further the accusations of ritual murder leveled by the pagans against the Christians and by the Christians against the Jews and Gnostics, also the Phoenician child sacrifices, rumors about the Black Mass, etc., and the ball game in church. Footnote. See further on the psychology of the trickster figure. And a footnote. 3. I saw a golden pig on the pedestal. Beast-like beings danced round it in a circle. We made haste to dig a hole in the ground. I reached in and found water. Then a man appeared in a golden carriage. He jumped into the hole and began swaying back and forth as if dancing. I swayed in rhythm with him. Then he suddenly leaped out of the hole, raped me, and got me with child. X is identical with the young girl, who often appears as a youth too. This youth is an animus figure, the embodiment of the masculine element in a woman. Youth and young girl together form a syzygy, or conjunctio, which symbolizes the essence of wholeness, as also does the platonic hermaphrodite, who later became the symbol of perfected wholeness in alchemical philosophy. X evidently dances with the rest, hence we made haste. The parallel with the motives stressed by Kerim seems to me remarkable. 4. I saw a beautiful youth with golden symbols, dancing and leaping in joy and abandonment. Finally, he fell to the ground and buried his face in the flowers. Then he sank into the lap of a very old mother. After a time he got up and jumped into the water, where he sported like a dolphin. I saw that his hair was golden. Now we were leaping together, hand in hand. So we came to a gorge. In leaping the gorge, the youth falls into the chasm. X is left alone and comes to a river where the white seahorse is waiting for her with a golden boat. In this scene, X is the youth. Therefore, he disappears later, leaving her the sole heroine of the story. She is the child of the very old mother and is also the dolphin the youth lost in the gorge, and the bride evidently expected by Poseidon. The peculiar overlapping and displacement of motives in all this individual material is about the same as in the mythological variants. X find the youth in the lap of the mother so impressive that she painted a picture of it. The figure is the same as in item 1, only instead of the grain of wheat in her hand, there is the body of the youth lying completely exhausted in the lap of the gigantic mother. 5. There now follows a sacrifice of sheep, during which a game of ball is likewise played with the sacrificial animal. The participants smear themselves with the sacrificial blood and afterwards bathe in the pulsing gore. 
X is thereupon transformed into a plant. 6. After that, X comes to a den of snakes, and the snakes wind all round her. 7. In a den of snakes beneath the sea, there is a divine woman asleep. She is shown in the picture as much larger than the others. She is wearing a blood-red garment that covers only the lower half of her body. She has a dark skin, full red lips, and seems to be of great physical strength. She kisses X, who is obviously in the role of the young girl, and hands her as a present to the many men who are standing by, etc. This chthonic goddess is the typical Earth Mother as she appears in so many modern fantasies. 8. As X emerged from the depths and saw the light again, she experienced a kind of illumination. White flames played about her head as she walked through waving fields of grain. With this picture, the Mother episode ended. Although there is not the slightest trace of any known myth being repeated, the motives and the connections between them are all familiar to us from mythology. These images present themselves spontaneously and are based on no conscious knowledge whatever. I have applied the method of active imagination to myself over a long time and have observed numerous symbols and symbolic associations which in many cases I was only able to verify years afterwards in texts of whose existence I was totally ignorant. It is the same with dreams. Some years ago I dreamed, for example, that I was climbing slowly and toilsomely up a mountain. When I had reached, as I imagined, the top, I found that I was standing on the edge of a plateau. The crest that represented the real top of the mountain only rose far off in the distance. Night was coming on, and I saw, on the dark slope opposite, a brook flowing down with a metallic shimmer, and two paths leading upwards, one to the left, the other to the right, winding like serpents. On the crest, to the right, there was a hotel. Down below, the brook ran to the left, with a bridge leading across. Not long afterwards, I discovered the following allegory in an obscure alchemical treatise. In his Speculative Philosophiae, the Frankfurt physician Gerald Dorn, who lived in the second half of the 16th century, describes the tour of the world, which we call the way of errors on the one hand, and the via veritatis, that is, the true way, on the other. On the first way, the author says, The human race, whose nature it is to resist God, does not cease to ask how it may, by its own efforts, escape the pitfalls which it has laid for itself. But it does not ask help from him, on whom alone depends every gift of mercy. Hence it has come about that men have built for themselves a great workshop on the left-hand side of the road, presided over by industry. After this has been attained, they turn aside from industry and bend their steps towards the second region of the world, making their crossing on the bridge of infirmity. But because the good God desires to draw them back, he allows their infirmities to rule over them. Then, seeking as before a remedy in themselves, industry, they flock to the great hospital, likewise built on the left, presided over by medicine. Here, there is a great multitude of apothecaries, surgeons and physicians, etc. Of the way of truth, which is the right way, our author says, you will come to the camp of wisdom, and on being received there, you will be refreshed with food far more powerful than before. Even the brook is there, a stream of living water flowing with such wonderful artifice from the mountain peak. From the fountain of wisdom the waters gush forth. 
An important difference compared with my dream is that here, apart from the situation of the hotel being reversed, the river of wisdom is on the right and not, as in my dream, in the middle of the picture. It is evident that in my dream we are not dealing with any known myth, but with a group of ideas which might easily have been rearranged as individual, i.e. unique. A thorough analysis, however, could show without difficulty that it is an archetypal image such as can be reproduced over and over again in any age and any place. But I must admit that the archetypal nature of the dream image only became clear to me when I read Dawn. These and similar incidents I have observed repeatedly, not only in myself, but in my patients. But, as this example shows, it needs special attention if such parallels are not to be missed. The antique mother image is not exhausted with the figure of Demeter. It also expresses itself in Cybele and Artemis. The next case points in this direction. 2. Case Y. Dreams 1. I am wandering over a great mountain. The way is lonely, wild and difficult. A woman comes down from the sky to accompany and help me. She is all bright with light hair and shining eyes. Now and then she vanishes. After going on for some time alone, I notice that I have left my stick somewhere and must turn back to fetch it. To do this I have to pass a terrible monster, an enormous bear. When I came this way, the first time I had to pass it, but then the sky woman protected me. Just as I am passing the beast, and he is about to come at me, she stands beside me again, and at her look the bear lies down quietly and lets us pass. Then the sky woman vanishes. Here we have a maternally protective goddess related to bears, a kind of Diana or the Gallo-Roman Dia Artio. The Sky Woman is the positive, the bear the negative aspect of the supraordinate personality, which extends the conscious human being upwards into the celestial and downwards into the animal regions. 2. We go through a door into a tower-like room where we climb a long flight of steps. On one of the topmost steps I read an inscription, Vis ut sis. The steps end in a temple situated on the crest of a wooden mountain, and there is no other approach. It is the shrine of Ursana, the bear goddess and mother of God in one. The temple is of red stone. Bloody sacrifices are offered there. Animals are standing about the altar. In order to enter the temple precincts, one has to be transformed into an animal, a beast of the forest. The temple has the form of a cross with equal arms and a circular space in the middle, which is not roofed, so that one can look straight up at the sky and the constellation of the bear. On the altar in the middle of the open space, there stands the moon bowl, from which smoke or vapor continually rises. There is also a huge image of the goddess, but it cannot be seen clearly. The worshippers, who have been changed into animals and to whom I also belong, have to touch the goddess's foot with their own foot, whereupon the image gives them a sign or an oracular utterance like vis ut sis. Vis ut sis, meaning that is life. In this dream, the bear goddess emerges plainly, although her statue cannot be seen clearly. The relationship to the self, the subordinate personality, is indicated not only by the oracle vis ut sis, but by the quaternity and the circular central precinct of the temple. From ancient times, any relationship to the stars has always symbolized eternity. The soul comes from the stars and returns to the stellar regions. Ursana's relation to the moon is indicated by the moon bowl. The moon goddess also appears in children's dreams. 
A girl who grew up in peculiarly difficult psychic circumstances had a recurrent dream between her seventh and tenth years. The moon lady was always waiting for me down by the water at the landing stage to take me to her island. Unfortunately, she could never remember what happened there, but it was so beautiful that she often prayed she might have this dream again. Although, as is evident, the true dreamers are not identical, the island motif also occurred in the previous dream as the inaccessible mountain crest. Thirty years later, the dreamer of the moon lady had a dramatic fantasy. I am climbing a steep dark mountain, on top of which stands a domed castle. I enter and go up a winding stairway to the left. Arriving inside the dome, I find myself in the presence of a woman wearing a headdress of cow's horns. I recognize her immediately as the moon lady of my childhood dreams. At her behest, I look to the right and see a dazzlingly bright sun shining on the other side of a deep chasm. Over the chasm stretches a narrow, transparent bridge, upon which I step, conscious of the fact that in no circumstances must I look down. An uncanny fear seizes me, and I hesitate. Dretchery seems to be in the air, but at last I go across and stand before the sun. The sun speaks. If you can approach me nine times without being burned, all will be well. But I grow more and more afraid. Finally, I do look down, and I see a black tentacle, like that of an octopus, groping towards me from underneath the sun. I step back in fright and plunge into the abyss. But instead of being dashed to pieces, I lie in the arms of the Earth Mother. When I try to look into her face, she turns to clay, and I find myself lying on the earth. It is remarkable how the beginning of this fantasy agrees with the dream. The moon lady above is clearly distinguished from the earth mother below. The former urges the dreamer to her somewhat perilous adventure with the sun. The latter catches her protectively in her maternal arms. The dreamer, as the one in danger, would therefore seem to be in the role of the Cori. Let us now turn back to our dream series. 3. Y sees two pictures in a dream, painted by the Scandinavian painter Hermann Christian Lund. 1. The first picture is of a Scandinavian peasant room. Peasant girls in gay costumes are walking about arm in arm, that is, in a row. The middle one is smaller than the rest and, besides this, has a hump and keeps turning her head back. This, together with her peculiar glance, gives her a witch-like look. 2. The second picture shows a dragon with its neck stretched out over the whole picture and especially over a girl, who is in the dragon's power and cannot move, for as soon as she moves, the dragon, which can make its body big or little at will, moves too and when the girl wants to get away, it simply stretches out its neck over her, and so catches her again. Strangely enough, the girl has no face, at least I couldn't see it. The painter is an invention of the dream. The animus often appears as a painter, or has some kind of projection apparatus, or is a cinema operator, or owner of a picture gallery. All this refers to the animus as the function mediating between conscious and unconscious. The unconscious contains pictures, which are transmitted, that is, made manifest by the animus, either as fantasies or, unconsciously, in the patient's own life and actions. The animus projection gives rise to fantasied relations of love and hatred for heroes or demons. The favorite victims are tenors, artists, movie stars, athletic champions, etc. 
In the first picture, the maiden is characterized as demonic, with a hump and an evil look over her shoulder. Hence, amulets against the evil eye are often worn by primitives on the nape of the neck, for the vulnerable spot is at the back where you can't see. In the second picture, the maiden is portrayed as the innocent victim of the monster. Just as before there was a relationship of identity between the sky woman and the bear, so here between the younger girl and the dragon, which in practical life is often rather more than just a bad joke. Here it signifies a widening of the conscious personality, i.e. through the helplessness of the victim on the one hand, and the dangers of the humpback's evil eye and the dragon's might on the other. 4. Part Dream, Part Visual Imagination A magician is demonstrating his tricks to an Indian prince. He produces a beautiful young girl from under a cloth. She is a dancer who has the power to change her shape or at least hold her audience spellbound by faultless illusion. During the dance, she dissolves with the music into a swarm of bees. Then she changes into a leopard, then into a jet of water, then into an octopus that has twined itself about a young pearl fisher. Between times, she takes human form again at the dramatic moment. She appears as a she-ass, bearing two baskets of wonderful fruits. Then she becomes a many-coloured peacock. The prince is beside himself with delight and calls her to him. But she dances on, now naked, and even tears the skin from her body, and finally falls down, a naked skeleton. This is buried, but at night a lily grows out of the grave and from its cup there rises a white lady who floats slowly up to the sky. This piece describes the successive transformations of the illusionist, artistry in illusion being a specifically female talent, until she becomes a transfigured personality. The fantasy was not invented as a sort of allegory. It was part a dream, Part Spontaneous Imagery 5. I am in a church made of grey sandstone. The apse is built rather high. Near the tabernacle, a girl in a red dress is hanging on the stone cross of the window. Suicide? Just as in the preceding cases, the sacrifice of a child or a sheep played a part. So here, the sacrifice of the maiden hanging on the, quote, cross. The death of the dancer is also to be understood in this sense, for these maidens are always doomed to die, because their exclusive domination of the feminine psyche hinders the individuation process, that is, the maturation of personality. The maiden corresponds to the anima of the man, and makes use of it to gain her natural ends, in which illusion plays the greatest role imaginable. But as long as a woman is content to be a femme à homme, she has no feminine individuality. Footnote. Femme à homme means a man's woman. She is empty and merely glitters, a welcome vessel for masculine projections. Woman as a personality, however, is a very different thing. Here illusion no longer works. So that when the question of personality arises, which is as a rule the painful fact of the second half of life, the childish form of the self disappears too. All that remains for me now is to describe the Cori as absorbable in man, the anima. Since a man's wholeness, insofar as he is not constitutionally homosexual, can only be a masculine personality, the feminine figure of the anima cannot be catalogued as a type of superordinate personality, but requires a different evaluation and position. 
In the products of unconscious activity, the anima appears equally as maiden and mother, which is why a personalistic interpretation always reduces her to the personal mother or some other female person. The real meaning of the figure naturally gets lost in the process, as is inevitably the case with all these reductive interpretations, whether in the sphere of the psychology of the unconscious or of mythology. The innumerable attempts that have been made in the sphere of mythology to interpret gods and heroes in a solar, lunar, astral, or meteorological sense contribute nothing of importance to the understanding of them. On the contrary, they all put us on a false track. When, therefore, in dreams and other spontaneous products, we meet with an unknown female figure whose significance oscillates between the extremes of goddess and whore, it is advisable to let her keep her independence and not reduce her arbitrarily to something known. If the unconscious shows her as an unknown, this attribute should not be got rid of by main force with a view to arriving at a rational interpretation. Like the superordinate personality, the anima is bipolar and can therefore appear positive one moment and negative the next, now young, now old, now mother, now maiden, now a good fairy, now a witch, now a saint, now a whore. Besides this ambivalence, the anima also has occult connections with mysteries, with the world of darkness in general, and for that reason she often has a religious tinge. Whenever she emerges with some degree of clarity, she always has a peculiar relationship to time. As a rule, she is more or less immortal, because outside time. Writers who have tried their hand at this figure have never failed to stress the anima's peculiarity in this respect. I would refer to the classic description in Ryder Haggard's She and The Return of She in Pierre Benoit's L'Atlantide, and above all in the novel of the young American author William M. Sloan, To Walk the Night. In all these accounts, the anima is outside time as we know it, and consequently immensely old, or a being who belongs to a different order of things. Since we can no longer, or only partially, express the archetypes of the unconscious by means of figures in which we religiously believe, they lapse into unconsciousness again and hence are unconsciously projected upon more or less suitable human personalities. To the young boy, a clearly discernible anima form appears in his mother, and this lends her the radiance of power and superiority, or else a demonic aura of even greater fascination. But because of the anima's ambivalence, the projection can be entirely negative. Much of the fear which the female sex arouses in men is due to the projection of the anima image. An infantile man generally has a maternal anima, an adult man the figure of a younger woman. The senile man finds compensation in a very young girl or even a child. Three, case Z. The anima also has affinities with animals, which symbolize her characteristics. Thus, she can appear as a snake, or a tiger, or a bird. I quote, by way of example, a dream series that contains transformations of this kind. Footnote. Only extracts from the dreams are given, so far as they bear on the anima. 1. A white bird perches on a table. Suddenly it changes into a fair-haired seven-year-old girl, and just as suddenly back into a bird, which now speaks with a human voice. 2. In an underground house, which is really the underworld, there lives an old magician and prophet with his daughter. She is, however, not really his daughter, 
She is a dancer, a very loose person, but is blind and seeks healing. 3. A lonely house in a wood, where an old scholar is living. Suddenly, his daughter appears, a kind of ghost, complaining that people only look upon her as a figment of fancy. 4. On the facade of a church, there is a gothic Madonna, who is alive and is the unknown and yet known woman. Instead of a child, she holds in her arms a sort of flame, or a snake, or a dragon. 5. 5. A black-clad countess kneels in a dark chapel. Her dress is hung with costly pearls. She has red hair, and there is something uncanny about her. Moreover, she is surrounded by the spirits of the dead. 6. A female snake comports herself tenderly and insinuatingly, speaking with a human voice. She is only accidentally shaped like a snake. 7. A bird speaks with the same voice, but shows herself helpful by trying to rescue the dreamer from a dangerous situation. 8. The unknown woman sits, like the dreamer, on the tip of a church spire and stares at him uncannily across the abyss. 9. The unknown woman suddenly appears as an old female attendant in an underground public lavatory with a temperature of 40 degrees below zero. 10. The unknown woman leaves the house as a petite bourgeois with a female relation, and in her place there is suddenly an over-life-size goddess clad in blue, looking like Athene. 11. Then she appears in the church, taking the place of the altar, still over life-size, but with veiled face. In all these dreams, the central figure is a mysterious feminine being with qualities like those of no woman unknown to the dreamer. The unknown is described as such in the dreams themselves and reveals her extraordinary nature, firstly by her power to change shape and secondly by her paradoxical ambivalence. Every conceivable shade of meaning glitters in her, from the highest to the lowest. Dream 1 shows the anima as elf-like, i.e. only partially human. She can just as well be a bird, which means that she may belong wholly to nature and can vanish, i.e. become unconscious, from the human sphere, i.e. consciousness. Dream 2 shows the unknown woman as a mythological figure from the beyond, that is the unconscious. She is the soror, or philia mystica, of a hierophant, or philosopher, evidently a parallel to those mystic syzygies which are to be met within the figures of Simon, Magnus and Helen, Zosimus and Theosobeia, Comarius and Cleopatra, etc. Our dream figure fits in best with Helen. A really admirable description of anima psychology in a woman is to be found in Erskine's Helen of Troy. Dream 3 presents the same theme, but on a more fairy tale like plane. Here, the anima is shown as rather spookish. Dream 4 brings the anima nearer to the Mother of God. The child refers to the mystic speculations on the subject of the redemptive serpent and the fiery nature of the Redeemer. In Dream 5, the anima is visualized somewhat romantically as the distinguished, fascinating woman, who nevertheless has dealings with spirits. Dream 6 and 7 bring theriomorphic variations. The anima's identity is at once apparent to the dreamer because of the voice and what it says. The anima has accidentally taken the form of a snake, 
Just as in Dream 1, she changed with the greatest ease into a bird and back again. As a snake, she is playing the negative role. As a bird, the positive. Dream 8 shows the dreamer confronted with his anima. This takes place high above the ground, i.e. above human reality. Obviously, it is a case of dangerous fascination by the anima. Dream 9 signifies the anima's deep plunge into an extremely subordinate position, where the last trace of fascination has gone and only human sympathy is left. Dream 10 shows the paradoxical double nature of the anima, banal mediocrity and Olympian divinity. Dream 11 restores the anima to the Christian church, not as an icon, but as the altar itself. The altar is the place of sacrifice and also the receptacle for consecrated relics. To throw even a moderate light on all these anima associations would require a special and very extensive investigation, which would be out of place here because, as we have already said, the anima has only an indirect bearing on the interpretations of the Kori figure. I have presented this dream series simply for the purpose of giving the reader some idea of the empirical material on which the idea of the anima is based. From this series and others like it, we get an average picture of what strange factor which has such an important part to play in the masculine psyche, and which naive presumption invariably identifies with certain women, imputing to them all the illusions that swarm in the male eros. It seems clear enough that a man's anima found occasion for projection in the Demeter cult. The Cori doomed to her subterranean fate, the two-faced mother and ethereomorphic aspects of both afforded the anima ample opportunity to reflect herself, shimmering and equivocal in the Eleusinian cult, or rather, to experience herself there and fill the celebrants with her unearthly essence to their lasting gain. For a man, Anima experiences are always of immense and abiding significance, but the Demeter Cori myth is far too feminine to have been merely the result of an anima projection. Although the anima can, as we have said, experience herself in Demeter Cori, she is yet of a wholly different nature. She is the highest degree of femme à homme, whereas Demeter Cori exists on the plane of mother-daughter experience, which is alien to man and shuts him out. In fact, the psychology of the Demeter cult bears all the features of a matriarchal order of society, where the man is an indispensable, but on the whole, disturbing factor. And that concludes the reading of the psychological aspects of the Cori. Hope you enjoyed it. And I would also like to thank everyone for their kind support last year. I did read every comment thus far, and they usually make my day. So, again, thanks for all that. I will try my best to keep making these videos at least somewhat regularly in 2019 as well, so you can hopefully look forward to that. Anyway, given how you've actually made it this far, let me ask you this. In what way do you plan to improve yourself or the world in 2019? Leave a comment below. I think we'll see some interesting stuff come out of this. Cheers, people. And as always, have a nice day.